across uh, different classes of organisms. So not surprisingly, we, we uh, concentrated on primates, humans, and birds. So when we talk about aging, what does this really mean? How do we link aging to reproduction? And what differs in males and females? What are the key drivers? And I'll talk a little bit about mechanisms. And then how um, can social factors alter these? Or how do we even figure out where to put it? Um, when we overview these aging processes in mammals and birds, it's really important to compare the uh, captive and the wild populations to make sense out of some of this. And we attempted, and this is really Peter, and he stretched my brain cells getting wrapping around some of this, what are the evolutionary um, origins for human post-reproductive life? So steroids function in all sorts of things. We know that they're part of sexual differentiation. We know that they drive endocrine and behavioral components of reproduction. We feel better. They're part of our metabolic health, our vigor. We have lots of people taking hormone replacement. It's used clinically in all sorts of applications. And if our steroids are off, we don't sleep well. Our circadian rhythms get messed up. They're part of our immune response, and there's gender differences in immunocompetence. Bone and muscle health, heart health. And we are subjected to a lifetime of steroids. We have them during early development. There are long-term effects. We know, and we can allude back to the endocrine disruptors that look like estrogens are now related to obesity in adults. And in fact, depending on, on some of the uh, timing for individuals, the loss of reproductive function can follow very individual tracks. We know the major hallmarks. We know that cycles become erratic and then eventually cease. We know that's related to hypothalamic and ovarian and testicular changes. And so what does reproductive senescence really mean? Well, in females, it's the cessation of ovarian function and the last cycle or menopause. In males, it's clearly more uh, general and gradual. And there is a loss of endocrine and behavioral uh, characteristics of reproduction. So let's start with the female. In females, there's a very predictable sequence of events with formation of stem cells, primordial follicles, loss of some of these cells in the uh, perinatal period, and then over the lifespan, a gradual loss year by year of these uh, follicles to ultimately result in, at the time of reproductive senescence, a drastic drop in the number of these primordial follicles. This has been presented by many, many authors in many ways, and there's considerable debate, which I'm not going to really talk about now, but we can certainly talk about it later. But across the species, not only in mammals, but in birds and in many other species, that loss with senescence occurs. It's a big problem for the uh, zoo folks that work with exotic species. They're trying to figure out how to cryopreserve those ova before they lose the valuable species. So, and the sperm. So what does this look like? Well, in primates, obviously, we know the general, we know the general cycle. And in the ovulating or mensing female, it's very regular becomes more irregular, and then as we finally call the flat liner period approaches, where basically reproduction has ceased, menopause has occurred, and uh, hormones are at a very, very low ebb. This is well characterized, related to changes in the LH surge, as well as in the feedback of inhibin to the pituitary gland, which then results in elevated FSH, pituitary gland FSH levels, which are again a diagnostic or a, or a index of going through menopause. So what happens? Well, if one goes through all the different alterations, and because of time I'm not going to, this is actually in our paper, I'm not going to go through this in, in detail, but it's basically the scenario I just talked about, which is, that at the level of the ovary, there are certain um, hormones, including the steroids that are produced, feedback. The lack of that feedback then allows FSH to be produced in higher quantities. And of course, the gonadotropin-releasing hormone system is responding all 
to all of these with a lot of the regulatory neuropeptides and neurotransmitter uh, systems that regulate it. In the male, similar scenario with inhibin regulating FSH. And again, I'm not going to go into this in detail because I know you all know this very, very well. I think the major point to be made here is that this interactive system differs across many, many species and classes. And there's a, a constant debate, which has been a lot of fun, about which comes first or which goes first, you know, the hypothalamus or the uh, gonads. And the other source of debate, which has been a lot of fun, has been uh, one that I and many of my colleagues have debated for a while. And Steve, I'm looking at you. No, I'm kidding. Um, where uh, there's a phenomena in rodents called constant estrus, which is uh, apparently related to this period of time where the system is really trying to keep the system going. But ovulation is not occurring, so the luteal phase with progesterone doesn't really happen. And so there's this effort by the system to really keep things going. That happens for a, a fair period of time in rodents, in birds and humans and non-human primates. There is this period of unopposed estrogen, but it's much shorter. So how do social influences fit into this? Well, we know that there are documented cases where wild chimpanzees have fertility, fertility retained until later life uh, that may be longer than in humans. We also know that there are plenty of examples of early fertility, and I, I know uh, especially in some of the domestic species where they are pushed to early fertility, that that causes an early cessation in reproduction or shortens their reproductive lifespan. There are other factors that come into that, including nutrition and other uh, influences that we can certainly talk about, but there is a relationship between early puberty and early cessation of reproduction. So now switching to the non-human primate male. This uh, is C57. He was one of our oldest males at the National Institute on Aging uh, facility in Poolsville. And he lived really, really well. He was supposed to be a calorie restricted guy, but I have to tell you, we all fed him extra whenever we were around him. <laughs> he was older. He was a very happy old guy. So what happens? Well, with aging, the pulsatile release of testosterone diminishes in older animals. And so there's a circadian rhythm, which then damps. So even though the pulses remain, the baseline then becomes lower over the 24 hours. And this can be viewed in these uh, bar graphs as well, so you can see that more clearly. That is related to, and sorry about the microprint, but um, that is related to changes in testicular structure and function. And those changes have often been used as hallmarks or telltales of aging in the male. Switching to birds. Okay, one of the things I'm hoping to convince you of today is that many of these mechanisms are very conserved. Same hormones, many of the same patterns, many of the same processes, many of the same mechanisms involved. So I'm an advocate of the comparative biology of aging, often from the standpoint that in simpler systems we can understand some of the mechanisms or at least tease them apart more clearly. Uh, that said, we end up in the complexities of that particular species or class of organisms and that has its own problems. But we've been able to relate a lot of the aging processes to fundamental changes through use of comparative models. And we can begin to articulate some of these fundamental tenets or mechanisms by taking advantage of a simpler system. So, in birds, we have long and short-lived species. The Japanese quail, which is our, our favorite, of course, uh, is short-lived, has clutch sizes that are quite large. They're seasonal, but if you keep them in the lab in long days, they lay an egg a day. And by the way, develop cancer uh, spontaneously because it's a rupture repair model as well. Terns, 
one of our favorite seabirds. Seabirds, some, something about the ocean is very healthy. These guys live a really long time. And they have much, much smaller clutch sizes. Kestrels, now our, our you know, uh, more carnivorous birds, uh, they live fairly long, have medium-sized clutches every year. Cranes, our, our favorite guys, are very long-lived and produce very few eggs per year or per season in clutch. All of these birds, if you take the eggs away, they'll continue to lay, so they're not determinate layers. But ordinarily, the longer-lived birds will produce fewer eggs in their clutches. Birds are also very plastic. So again, a difference between birds and mammals is that they retain the ability to reproduce their hair cells. And they have other forms of plasticity, neuroplasticity, plasticity that I'll show you in a moment. In the cranes, we can follow their reproduction very easily with fecal steroids. This is just to show you the kinds of things we can do. And we can relate the steroids and the stress levels and then uh, look at personalities. In this particular study, we followed 10 pairs and linked them back to who produced successful offspring and who didn't. And I can tell you the nervous females did not raise good chicks. So. They show <coughs> aging. This is a captive kestrel colony in, at the Texas Wildlife Center in Laurel. Over the years, by 10 years, they're producing very few eggs. And by the 11th, those pairs that are lifetime pairs are not producing anymore. So they show an age-related decline in reproduction. And um, I'm not going to go through these slides in detail, but I'm going to give you the bottom line of this. These slides basically show you that the number of follicles and the volume of yolk decline with aging. They go through, this, these are Japanese quail. They're layers, then they become irregular, and then they become non-layers. The interesting thing is that the ovary weight doesn't really change. Not only that, but if one begins to look at the follicles, and these are primary, secondary, you know, uh, the, the ones that haven't really developed the uh, primary follicle zero, one, or two, there is a decline over aging and in the non-layers, okay? But what becomes really interesting is that even in these non-layers, they still have the ability to produce a lot of progesterone in response to stimulation. So even though the ovary is no longer active, they are still able to have steroidogenic responses in response to stimulation. So what does that mean? Well, we've kind of taken it to mean that it's the hypothalamus that shuts down primarily before the ovary is really non-functional. We know it's an interplay, but in the bird world, it appears to be more driven by the hypothalamic system becoming less responsive than the ovary losing its ability to produce follicles. In the males, there's a similar kind of thing that happens that then results in, when one compares, these are hypothalamic slices in vitro, young and old females, again, the GnRH release, even though it remains pulsatile, is damped, same in the males, higher and then damped. When challenged with norepinephrine, less of a response. But that is not due to the lack of producing GnRH message. That is due to the lack of producing GnRH. In our birds, and we've done a lot of work with behavior, and I'm not really going to say too much about it today, but one of the, thing, the things that's really interesting is that we seem to have this um, ability of some of the males to find, to remain behaviorally active. So these are 36 month old males. They are either senescent or they're reproductively behaviorally active, showing courtship and mating behavior. This is aromatase enzyme. Just like in mammals, aromatase enzyme is critical to convert testosterone to estradiol to stimulate behavioral areas in the brain. 
these active males are able to keep more of their aromatase production. And they do it by, uh, sorry, this is off the bottom, but by making their cells larger. They show neuroplasticity. They, they lose some of their aromatase producing cells, but the ones they retain become more active. So they show a compensatory neuroplasticity, if you will. And one of the things I want to mention in passing in, in birds and in some other species, there's a, another hormone that hasn't received a lot of study yet. It's called gonadotropin inhibiting hormone. We see in the median eminence a lot more of it in whole birds that are senescent. So again, that raises the question about what is this interplay between different signals? Because remember, birds use GNIH, or gonadotropin inhibiting hormone, to trigger photoregression as well. Are some of these signals getting you know, crisscrossed? What's happening to actually regulate the system? And what are the environmental factors that are coming in to give the signaling? So these are data collected by Bob Rickloffs and his lab. And what they show is that now when one uh, compares wild versus captive animals across species, not surprisingly, they have lower mortality in a captive setting than in a uh, wild setting. And their decline over aging actually is somewhat muted in the uh, captive. In other words, they live longer. And that's not particularly surprising because you know crises and things happen in the wild, and they're protected. So that raises the question about post-reproductive lifespan, and who has that? Well, in females, we know when post-reproductive lifespan starts. You know, the, the ovary's not working anymore, they're menopausal, the ovarian cycles have stopped. I mean, it's pretty clear. In males, it's really hard to define when that happens. In mammals, there are data from whales uh, that show that there's a post-reproductive lifespan. There are short periods of reproductive lifespan shown in a number of other species. And so it, it, it's documented. But now the question is domestic species as well versus um, captive, you know, again, the question of captive versus wild. In domestic species, there are some incidences of post-reproductive lifespan documented for cattle and rabbits and horses and red deer. And then with non-human primates as well. In birds, and this shows basically a combination of it, but you know, all the, the chickens, the galliforms, the ducks, you know, the quail, all these sorts of species are most of them are short lived. And they don't usually they can certainly live post reproductive lifespan if they're kept as pets or whatever. I mean they can live on past when they stop reproducing in captivity, but generally not in wild. Seabirds are very long-lived, and so the question becomes, do they have negligible senescence? We've looked uh, with Ian Nisbet at terns, and at some point, you begin to see some signs of reproductive um, decline. But again, the confound is that those birds, and they're migrating, and they're getting stressed, and they're having to deal with a lot of other challenges, we probably don't see that many of them because they probably don't survive. The survivorship goes down. So how do you really determine this? In the Galapagos, the seabirds also show similar kinds of patterns. They live a long time. Finding those aging individuals, usually the ones you find are the ones that are still breeding. You usually don't see the ones that aren't breeding any longer. So we don't know what those populations look like. So if we integrate all this together and we try to say something about the interplay between genotype, environment, phenotype, now I'm going to bring up this whole endocrine disruptor question that we were talking about a little bit earlier. How do environmental <coughs> factors play in this? How does this all get integrated together to make some sort of sense out of all this? And you know, what can we do to actually assess health and lifespan and behavioral ecology kinds of endpoints that we can integrate into a working model that would allow us to understand some of these kinds of 
dynamic uh, interactions. If one were to overlay characteristics like endocrine disruptors and now overlay it on this long and short-lived species kind of scenario, I would propose that you see not only a muted reproductive fitness, if you will, or muted fitness, but you would also see perhaps a shortened reproductive lifespan. The problem is we don't know. So in humans, what are the drivers of change? Well, we have reduced mortality, longer lifespan. There doesn't seem to be much of a change at the age of, of menopause. What about males? Do males reproduce longer? I don't know. What about environmental factors? What about endocrine disruptors, climate, limiting factors that might be nutrition, <coughs> lifestyle, living in the suburb versus the city? We know the population's going to increase drastically. We know types of food sources are going to have to change. Agriculture is going to have to adapt. I think somebody alluded to that this morning. I think Tuck did. And we know the social cooperation has benefits. So there might be a path of extended reproductive life where there's genetic change to slow the loss of follicles in the females, the follicular reserve. Or there might be a path of indirect reproductive effort, which means that postmenopausally, we all help our, relate, you know, our relatives. As such, we have a challenge to develop relevant models. Those that have conserved mechanisms and show benefits from positive social status, as well as integrating in again the environmental factors, climate, air, water, population, and then establishing animal models for study that in which we can simplify the variables so we can get our heads around. We need to design bioindicators and interventions and make sense out of the outcomes and model all this. And then there's something now being used in this endocrine disruptor arena that's called adverse outcomes pathways. And that's their attempt to try to put a lot of these things together in some framework where, again, we can get our heads around it. So that's what I have. And hopefully, we won't be too small compared to these uh, critters that are swimming around us, but uh, thank you.